Okay, uh, we now have a quorum and we'll begin the closing the Justice Gap Sage subcommittee meeting. This meeting is being recorded and with permission of the chairs, I will start with the roll call. Uh, Mary Baldwin. Present. John Lund. Present. Uh, Andrew Ruda. Judge Wendy Chang. Here. Dan Grunfeld. Present. Eric Helland. Uh, present. Wendy Musell. Present and Jim Sandman. Okay, we are good to go. Um, okay, so I think our first uh, item is for is, uh, public comment, is that right, Mimi? Yes, yes, if you'd like to give public comment, you'll be given two minutes. Um, please use the raise hand function and I'll call on you and give you permission, the ability to speak. And we'll start with Ira Spiro. Thank you. My, my name's Ira Spiro. Sorry. <laughs> Happens a lot. Um, I'm a uh, member of the paraprofessional working group. It's kind of working uh, alongside you all. Um, and uh, I'm a former member of the, uh, what's uh, loosely called the Legal Ethics uh, Committee of the State Bar, uh, com COPRAC Committee on Professional Responsibility and Conduct. Um, and I have a question that uh, I, I want to pose to all the members of your working group. Um, and, and I think everyone listening and the whole state would, would like to know an answer. What, what is the justification or what could it be for allowing people or, or organizations uh, to control or own in any measure a law firm, if those, if the peop, those people are not subject to the same uh, rules of professional responsibility and other ethics uh, laws uh, that lawyers are uh, responsible for, are held to. On the, I wanna point out that in the paraprofessional uh, proposal that we issued, our, our working group issued last month, the paraprofessionals sorry, are all subject to essentially the same legal ethics requirements as lawyers are. So uh, that's a sincere question. And I hope uh, that uh, all of us get an answer to. Thank you. Next, we have Rhett Francisco. Rhett, you'll have two minutes. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Again, my name is Rhett Francisco, and I appreciate the brief opportunity to be heard. I am speaking on behalf of the 20 plus lawyers at the law firm that I work at, the Employee Justice Legal Group, as well as the 40 plus staff, uh, as well as my colleagues uh, who are not able to be present here. Uh, briefly, I think the concern is with regard specifically from my perspective, um, with regard to the amendment to Rule 5.4 and the proposed rule 5.7 specific to fee sharing and non-attorneys owning and operating law firms. The concern here is that it will result not in an increase to access to justice, but in access to predatory business practices on what are inevitably the most vulnerable people in our communities. Uh, this is specific and most important or particularly important to employment law, which is where I specialize. Employment law is nuanced and is often interpreted wrong. It is um, changed. The statutes are interpreted through case law, and it's gotten wrong remarkably by those who are not in the know and who are not specifically trained in employment law. This is particularly important in light of potential 1542 waivers of all, any and all rights. And at the very least, there should be a threshold level of demonstrated competence not unlike the baby bar at the very least for anyone, regardless of whether they are an attorney or not licensed by the bar as a practicing attorney or not to practice, to share fees and to own and operate a law firm. Thank you very much. Um, is there anybody else who would like to give public comment? Please use the raise hand function. Otherwise we'll move on with the rest of the agenda. 
Uh, we have uh, Randy Johnson. You'll be given two minutes to speak. Randy, you need to unmute yourself, please. Sorry, everybody. I had to unmute myself and uh, I'm right in the middle of a meeting, but I thought this was very important that I come and raise my objection to this whole thing. I first heard of this whole situation in Las Vegas. I've emailed 20 of my friends that I went to law school. Nobody knows that this was going on. I think that what you're, what's going to happen here, you're going to cheapen the profession. I have been in this business for 25 years, and some of my colleagues are on the screens now. Um, people who know me, I just, I mean, I worked really hard to get through. The, it took me a long time to get through law school, a long time to get through the bar. I took the baby bar, and now I see this paraprofessional program coming up. And it's, that's just, it's just the back door, guys. It's a back door to, to come around and get us from the back and take away our business. And I, I, and I, I think it, um, there, there's a lot of places, we have a lot of things, a lot of the other avenues, self-help, um, uh, these, uh, the, the volunteer groups, but there's a lot of other ways to get this done. I have a pair of legals that work with me, but I supervise them. Who's gonna be supervising the, the prayer professionals? Who's going to be doing that? I mean, we pay our dues to the state bar to 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 increase our profession, not to take away from our profession. And I I really I really think that there's a lot of people out here that a lot of lawyers that don't know about this. When I was in Vegas, we had a whole room of people talking. Three quarters of the people had never even heard of this thing. So I think that. Um, I think that there's other ways to do this. You know, why are we going out uh, to explore Mars right now when we can just be doing what we need to do in our own society, in our own bar, uh, uh, our, our own bar uh, uh, situation? I mean, right now we're going out and trying to create another atmosphere. I don't, I don't understand it. So that's all I have, and I'm, I'm just really opposed to this, and I'm really ashamed of what's going on here. Thank you. Okay. Um... Next, we have uh, Jeannie Harrison. Jeannie, you'll have two minutes. Jeannie, are you with us? Okay, uh, we'll move on to James Lewis. James, you'll have two minutes. You need to unmute yourself. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, if the state bar is trying to increase access to, to justice, um, what it ought to do, in my opinion, rather than license non-attorneys or paraprofessionals to do the work that lawyers do. Um, I'm not one to suggest that the state bar impor, impose more requirements on its members, but akin to the state bar asking that we, or mandating that we uh, put in 25 hours of continuing legal education over three years. I think that model is something that you can transfer or apply to a pro bono practice. I don't think you'd have much objection from the members if it were the state bar were to mandate five or 10 hours whatever it might see fit after some research of pro bono work by its membership that can be easily certified by any number of nonprofit organizations here in Sacramento. There's the Northern California Legal Services Office, which is in desperate need of, of attorneys to do work for it. And there are numerous other clinics like that that can easily certify that this particular attorney has contributed the requisite minimum number of hours I think that is a great alternative to licensing non-lawyers to better serve the underserved members of the public. Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> next we have, uh, let's see, James Lewis. Oh, did we just have James Lewis? Sorry, uh, Jennifer Kramer. Uh, you'll be given two minutes. 
I just okay. unmuted myself. All right. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so I just wanted to start by saying, you know, it's throughout my career as a lawyer, and I've been practicing for over 21 years, it's always been emphasized as a lawyer that we, the importance of ethics in our profession in order to provide a safeguard to the public. Uh, it starts in law school when you're required to take ethics classes. It's required to become a lawyer. We're required to pass an ethics exam. And it's required every few years and we're required to take ethics classes. And it's overseen by the state bar. And I'm concerned about opening up the practice of law to individuals who are not working under those same constrictions. I'm also, as a contingency fee lawyer, um, we spend a large part of our practice talking to the public for free. We do free consultations with people to talk to them about whether or not they have a case. So we are providing a service to individuals um, free of charge. Most of most plaintiffs attorneys in the state will tell you the same thing. They'll talk to somebody for at least an hour about their case to decide whether or not to take it. And then third, I have a concern about um, opting to a model of um, addressing the concern about access to judges justice to opening up to for-profit um, companies rather than focusing on nonprofits who have, have a demonstrated track record of um, servicing low-wage workers and um, uh, other at-risk communities in, in, in the state. Um, so thank you for your time. And I would urge you to look at other alternatives other than going down the road that you're going down now. Thank you. Okay. Um, next, we have, we'll try this again, Jeannie Harrison. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. All right. Thank you so much. Um, Jeannie Harrison, and I am president of Consumer Attorneys Association of Los Angeles. I've been practicing law representing um, actual underserved uh, individuals, uh, victims, people who have been victimized by corporations and human beings. Uh, alike for almost 30 years. And um, I, I understand that what you, what this specific committee is looking at is what are the regulations that need to exist uh, for this sandbox entity? And what that means is that you're talking about what are the non-lawyer corporations that should be allowed to practice law um, and represent others, give advice to others, the others being many of the people whom they victimize directly. There is absolutely nothing that I have seen that will in any way, shape, or form uh, prohibit or guard against the companies that actually victimize others, employees, and, and others um, from being able to, quote unquote, practice law and take those people's cases against those companies, nor are you going to be able to figure out who those companies are because they're gonna be all based on some shell companies that own one another, et cetera, et cetera. And this is not fake, it's totally real. That's the way this works. And so um, I, I think that what you have to do is start with the, um, the strictest protections for human beings and the underserved and those are who are going to be targeted by these corporations, not the least protections. And I have heard over and over again in your meetings, you have how seconds remaining. the goal, the, the focus has to be on, um, uh, on innovation. No, it does not. It needs to be on protection of human beings. Thank you. Okay, and last we have James Lewis. James, you'll need to mute yourself. I already spoke, but thank you for oh, the chance sorry. to speak again. I'll piggyback uh, on the, the previous <laughs> oh, <no>. person's <laughs> comment, though, if you don't mind, just um, briefly. We, we need to move on with your agenda, so sorry. You're only given one opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm trying to keep track of this. Okay, uh, next we have, we do have a few more people who've raised their hands now. Daniel Foruzan. 
Good afternoon, Attorney Daniel Frusen, President of the Westside Bar Association. First and foremost, I just want to say thank you guys for what you're doing. I understand a lot of people, a lot of attorneys are adverse to these measures, but ultimately I appreciate that you guys are trying to get more people, more access to justice, and that's a good thing. I think what matters is how we go about it, and I'll just point out this one thing. There are jobs, in my opinion, there are crafts, in my opinion, and I think being a lawyer is not just a job, it's a craft. There's a reason attorneys are first to go through ho hoops in order to practice. Our clients often put their hearts, their bank accounts, their lives in our hands, and they use our guidance to make critical decisions. For us to get there, we have to go through a litany of training, examination, ethical understandings. And a lot of these ethical questions come into play whether you're you know, directing a client in terms of what they should do or whether you're holding their funds into a trust. I think many of the measures we're discussing today, whether it be the paraprofessional, whether it be allowing for-profit entities to own law firms, a lot of these measures are going to water down the craft in a manner that's worse for everyone, including the people we're here to serve. I think a lot of these measures water down the craft of being a counselor and will enable a lower quality of law ultimately for the end user. And everyone's going to suffer as a result. The state bar will have more issues to deal with. More people out there will have access to worse qualities of justice and, and all sorts of un, you know, things that we can't predict right now, all sorts of questionable consequences are easily triggered just by an assessment of the ethical possibilities that could come up with some of these measures. And I would simply ask everyone who's listening, please consider you know, what kind of a future watering down the craft may make, not just for the attorneys, but for the people who rely on them. Thank you. Okay, um, next we have uh, Glenn Kenna. Good afternoon. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak. Um, I'm a plaintiff's personal injury attorney in Sacramento and a large part of uh, my client base are, are people who are underserved, who are on public benefits and and what i see across the board is that that they don't have legal savvy um, they rely on their lawyers and these contingency fee situations to to have their best interests and that's something i spend a, a large part of my day thinking about and i think everybody does you know what's ethical what is best for these clients and so when i look at the the proposals here, and I, I see the the working group kicking around, allowing for-profit businesses and non-lawyers into this space where, where we are helping these people, it fills me with dread because they don't have the same ethical duties we do. They aren't going to have the best interests of these people in, in mind. And at least as far as contingency fee cases go, um, we don't we don't charge these people. We don't if they don't recover money, we don't recover anything. So that there's not a, a gap in, in the ability to pay for services in this space. I'd say that the state bar's resources would be better spent um, trying to figure out how to make it easier. For, for these cases to, to get to trial in our courts, uh, which are overburdened and underfunded, than to open up the, the floodgates to Walmart claims or, or whatever it might be that comes into this space to, to try to uh, take advantage of these people um, who, who have the least amount of understanding of, of how our legal system works. Uh, thank you very much. Miss Lee, you're uh, you're muted. No one can oh, hear. Oh, sorry. You. Sorry about that. I'm Ebby Bakhtiar. <laughs> Thank you. This is Ebby Bakhtiar. I appreciate the time. 
being a, a, a plaintiff's attorney for over 20 years now, my entire practice has been dedicated to serving uh, injured, predominantly employees uh, who have been discriminated against or who have suffered some type of um, termination that, that is illegal. Uh, majority of my clients are Latino. They either don't speak English or speak broken English, and they rely wholly on my decision making. Um, and what concerns me is particularly in light of the most recent revelations about platforms such as Facebook that were revealed just in the past couple of days, that allowing, and also not to forget the most recent scandal that's arisen out of a very well-known, well-reputed large law firm um, in Los Angeles, you know, allowing for-profit corporations to enter into this space will only compound these risks because there's an inherent conflict of interest between a for-profit corporation and the consumer at large. So allowing non-lawyers to practice into the field of consumer protection laws I think would be disastrous, not just for you know lawyers who are already in this field. I don't think that they will really compete with trial lawyers who are skilled and know how to take cases to trial. Um, I think what they will do is they will monopolize the industry, taking the information that is very critical to the consumer and shaping and molding that in such a way where the consumer is misinformed. And that is the worst thing that could happen for consumers if the purpose of the bar is to allow them or afford them more access to justice. There are plenty of nonprofit organizations that are here for consumer protection, in addition to the contingency fee lawyers, that are under strict guidelines of the bar for ethics and attorney-client privilege and all sorts of other, other um, regulations that we have to abide by. That you have 10 seconds remaining. Sure, that the for-profit corporations will not have to abide by. And if one is penalized for doing something wrong, they can easily rename and come back into the field and no one will know who's involved. This is a very Your dangerous path up. that you're following. Thank you. Okay, and last we have uh, Mark Rusikoff. Good morning, I guess good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I think it's great that the bar is trying to democratize the law and give access. And we're all in favor of that. And I think someone previously mentioned requiring pro bono might be an excellent idea. But I think along the lines of what everyone else is saying is when we allow non-licensed professionals and for-profit corporations to get involved, you have a lot of problems that are gonna happen. I mean, all day long, I listen to people both in contingency and hourly matters and I turn their cases down because I think they're frivolous. I think that if you let people that are, or corporations as well, that are worrying about profits, I do think they're gonna take cases. I think they might be a race to the bottom on pricing. No longer are contingencies one third, we're doing them at 20%. Then it gets to the point where people are just taking cases just to take cases to make money. I, I think it's gonna be very difficult to regulate this, particularly when you're dealing with nonprofit corporations. And instead of having these referral agencies on TVs, we might have these large conglomerates doing contingency work, hiring tons of attorneys and saying, you need to take this case. You have a quota. I think we're going down a slippery slope and it can be dangerous. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we can move on with the rest of our agenda now. Okay, great, Mimi, thank you. And thanks to everybody who gave public comment. Uh, announcements. Do we have any announcements? Uh, I don't think so. So let's go on to staff report. The only thing I want to mention is that at the last uh, closing the Justice Gap Working Group meeting, I did announce the uh, at that time anticipated action of the Board of Trustees on the California Power Professional Working Group uh, report and recommendations. They did uh, consider it. They did act on it. Uh, the only difference from what I reported previously is that the public comment period is actually longer than what was uh, recommended. They have uh, given a deadline of January 12, 2022. So if your uh, concerns and your interest is with regard to that particular initiative, uh, you have until that time to submit your written comment to the State Bar. The other thing I'll mention is that uh, we have confirmed 
one speaker for the next meeting of the closing of the Justice Gap Working Group, which is scheduled for October 18th. And that speaker is uh, Stacey, Professor Stacy Butler, who's the Director of Innovation for Justice, University of Arizona School of Law, also with the University of Utah School of Business. And so look forward to that uh, presentation at our next meeting. We're actually working on another speaker as well, but uh, we have yet to confirm. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Randy. Um, then next on the agenda is the approval of the open session action summary from the August 25th, 2021 meeting. Is there a motion? So moved. Okay, a second. Second. Any discussion? Who right. seconded it? I didn't, um, I couldn't tell by the voice. That was me, Wendy. Okay, thank, thank you, Wendy. All right, um, I'll take the vote. Um, Mary Baldwin. Aye. John Lund. Aye. Andrew Arruda. Aye. Judge Wendy Chang. Yes. Dan Grunfeld. Aye. Eric Helland. Aye. Wendy Musell. No. Jim Sandman. Aye. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right, now we'll move into our discussion of uh, the materials that um, and, the, and the issues on our agenda for today. And um, I'm just going to pull up that the memo that was circulated. And this was a, a, a kind of composite um, memo. It included some of the, it kind of recapped where we are. It uh, includes some of the materials that were, uh, or the issues that were held over from last meeting. Um, and then it also presented some new uh, information that we're gonna consider today. And I really thank the staff in particular, uh, Bridget and Randy for their work in getting this done. Um, so um, first on the, uh, in, the, in the memo, we have the in section two, um, and, and this uh, overall, of course, is talking about uh, risk-based regulation um, and then some of the other regulatory um, considerations uh, that we could use. Um, in this section 2A, we're talking about uh, the risk-based regulatory approach. We've already approved some items, um, some principles um, concerning risk-based regulatory uh, regulation. And then there were uh, two remaining um, points in the memo that we've been discussing um, that we haven't acted on yet. And those are listed here at three and four. So we've talked about, we've, you know, we've already identified uh, the possible harms, um, but these, these last two um, sections of the previous memo that we want to address here today um, number three is that lawyers participating in sandbox entities should remain subject to the same rules governing other licensees of the bar, except to the extent that compliance with specified rules is waived. And then number four, entities uh, participating in the sandbox should be subject to the rules governing licensees of the bar, except to the extent that compliance with specified rules is waived. So this issue of, you know, what uh, regulations and, and what rules will apply to both lawyers and entities who participate in the sandbox um, is a is obviously an important one. We heard uh, public comment addressing that issue today, and we've we've heard it before. Um, and it's also something that um, runs through the work of both of our committees. The scope committee is considering some issues that are that kind of overlap with with these two principles. Um, uh, as I understand it, at their meeting on Friday, so we'll definitely be, um, you know, looking at these issues from a couple of different ways. Um, these two points were intended to, you know, not be the definitive, all-inclusive statement about regulation, but to just establish these th threshold points that, you know, first lawyers who are participating are going to be subject to the same rules that they would otherwise again, except to the extent that specified rules are waived and, and an extension of that, that entities would be subject to the rules governing licensees of the bar, except to the extent that compliance with rules is waived. And that's important because, you know, right now 
entities aren't regulated under our system of regulation for in, in large, uh, in to a large uh, degree, we really go, we, our system of attorney regulation is based on, a, on an individual um, uh, sort of point of regulation. That's how our rules are drafted, et cetera. So this would, would expand those rules to entities. Um, so I guess, I guess the, what I'd like to do here, we've discussed these issues uh, a little bit in prior meetings, um, but I would like to um, have whatever additional discussion that we, we might want to have on items three and four here, um, and then see if we can reach a consensus about moving these forward. Um, Wendy? Uh, as I've indicated previously, I have, uh, um, my concerns are manifold. My first concern is that the standard of review for any sort of professional negligence that was voted on and approved, I believe I was the only no vote, was uh, related to if there was no assistance at all, um, no legal services provided at all. That is an illusory standard and it is not one that a consumer can um, utilize in any way. It's not known in law and no regulatory agency that I'm aware of in the entire state of California has utilized a similar illusory standard. I think that um, will cause a great deal of harm to consumers. And I think it also does an enormous disservice to those persons who would receive legal services from sandbox participants to not know in advance that if something goes terribly wrong, and hopefully we would, it wouldn't, but if it does, that their ability to address that through the court system is going to be deeply affected. Pile onto that the issues in three and four. And my, my problem is, except to the extent that compliance with specified rules is waived as used within both three and four, um, in order for there to be a functional regulatory environment that actually uh, supports um, consumer protection and uh, gives notice to both to sandbox participants as well as the public as to what they're getting, um, there should be rules specified in advance. Um, I'm against waiving uh, ethical rules. I don't see any sort of reason to do so. I don't think it's in the public, uh, you know, it's not for the public protection. And I don't see any demonstrated evidence that we need to do so although I'm happy to, to continue to review all of the materials, which I have been doing, um, to see if it would be actually supported. But in any event, to the extent that we determine that we wish to waive any sort of ethical rules and responsibilities, those should be upfront. So if I'm a consumer and I'm looking to hire someone to perform legal services, I know if I'm getting apples or oranges. If the oranges, uh, lack of, of ethical rules and coupled with that, a lack of standard of review, I'm getting a far lower uh, ability to address issues that might arise. And some of these ethical rules have been created over time with the experience of the state bar and their support. It's, it's surprising to me that we're actually here um, at this juncture but some of these rules are, are just integral to having um, competent legal services that keep your client involved and informed, such as settlement issues, such as um, you know, if problems occur. Uh, some of the rules that were listed as possibly waivable go to the very heart of the relationship with the client. And there doesn't seem to be any discernible legitimate reason in order to waive those. Uh, I think we would need a lot of review of those particular rules and why we would wish to waive them. But in any event, it seems to be, if we are thinking about waiving rules on a case-by-case -case basis, um, that doesn't provide any notice to the consumer. It also doesn't provide a level of playing field for all of those individuals providing legal services, including those that are participants in the sandbox. Doesn't seem to make any sense to me. Um, 
it also, as I've raised in prior meetings, I think there's a major issue here with the legislature and the role of the legislature. What it appears that is being proposed here is the legislature would have no role in which rules would be waived on an ad hoc basis. It seems to me that if you have a, a regulator who can decide on an ad hoc basis, what rules apply and what rules don't, you really don't have a, a system of law at all. Um, I can't imagine that other areas of consumer or environmental protection would be uh, performed in this manner. I also think that it runs afoul of the uh, relative duties and powers of the legislature, as well as the court system. The legislature uh, does have a role here and the legislature has made it very clear and I've communicated that this is from the legislature that um, having rules that would be waived on an ad hoc basis that the legislature does not have an ability to weigh in on does infringe on their powers. So for all of those reasons, um, I oppose the way that three and four are currently written. Okay, Wendy, let me just ask, um, if, if, if it were clear that, we, that these two resolutions are not intending to suggest that there be an ad hoc determination or that uh, and are, are not intended to abrogate the legislative role in determining any waiver of you know, rules or statutes, would that, would that address your concern? Well, I think we would have to back up for a second to say we're going to create rules whatever those rules are going to be. We may have disagreements within the, the sandbox uh, participants and members uh, what those rules ought to be, but we ought to have it up front, not on the back end. So up front, we ought to say, these are the rules that are going to apply and we can all weigh in on it. I'm sure there may be differences of opinion, but just knowing what the rules are up front and that the legislature has the opportunity to say yay or nay as to these are the rules that would apply to this new entity. I think that's what's required. Um, and so, you know, just- If that getting, were clear, would that, would that take care of, of some of your concerns then with respect to these two, two? Some of the concerns. Then we get into, so that's the overarching um, structure then we get into the weeds, which is which rules apply and which don't. Well, yeah, but I just want to point out that, that these, these two, and that's, that's part of what I'm trying to communicate. So we see if we could uh, address some of your concerns and, or, or allay them. These are not purporting, we're not purporting at this point to be making any kind of recommendation about which rules might be waived or how that waiver might take place and be accomplished. My understanding from reading all of the materials and prior, uh, including today's and prior materials, I haven't been sitting on, <laughs> on my, my time here, um, is that the, the plan is to have an ad hoc decision per application as to which rules would be waived. That is present in the application that was presented in either the last meeting or the prior meeting. And um, I haven't heard any discussion or contemplation that we would actually have the rules up front so that everybody gets to see what they are and the legislature gets to rule on them. So I think it would have to be very explicit that the rules would be decided in advance. They would be presented along with this whole uh, package to the legislature to, to um, vote on. Um, but that, so I think, I don't know if a, a small edit to three and four would get at it. I think it has to be uh, explicit in all of those ways. Okay, uh, Bridget. You're muted. Sorry. Too many buttons, I'm confused. Um, thanks, I, I think you, you covered it, Wendy. And just as somebody was, that was putting these resolutions together, 
we know there's going to be debate about what rules are subject are going to be even subject to waiver. The process for doing that is something that we're going to be discussing later. And here, really what we're trying to get at or what I was trying to do, I, mean, I purposefully use passive voice in this context just because we still have to decide the process for which all of this is going to happen. But what we're trying to get at here, just for purposes of this broad approach, is to just the, the principle that lawyers are going to be, even if you're acting in a sandbox, you're still subject to the rules of professional conduct that you would be subject to, typically. And same with entities. Those are like the biggest things. The way that the rules are going to be waived, the consumer protection, the disclosure, the things that you were talking about, like being concerned about consumers, we're going to talk about that today. And I really hope we can get to that discussion because this, we just haven't had a chance yet to really get into the mechanics of the way that the sandbox is going to be operating. And that's what I really want to make sure that we have time for today. So our plan was to talk about this as an approach and then get into how, what are we concerned about and how can we design something to ensure that consumers are protected and that they are aware of what's happening. Those are the kind of, this is a different way that we typically regulate. So we wanna start getting into those questions as well. So just to kind of explain how I was trying to tee up this memo was big picture, everyone's subject to the rules and then the, that's just really what we're trying to get at right here. So I just wanted to explain that as far as like what we were trying to tee up for a vote. Uh, John? I just wanted to observe that if, if we were to take the approach that I, I understand Wendy's suggesting and you know not even consider waivers here and simply spell out that lawyers are subject to the rules of other licensees of the bar and so are entities, we'd essentially not have a sandbox because one aspect of those rules or another is essentially what we're talking about altering in order to explore. And it is just an exploration, it is just an experimentation. It's, it is a interim testing of these things and it is just to be able to explore what happens with this and, and develop actual data around that idea that if, for example, with Holy Cross Ministries, which is the example that's attached, we have non-lawyers helping advise on a bilingual basis about medical debt issues to people who, you know, to Wendy's point, otherwise don't have any legal representation. Th that's the whole point. And to let that be tried by non-lawyers in that discrete area with the articulated oversight by lawyers that is spelled out in the order is precisely the type of innovation that we are trying to allow to be tried. And I think that um, to, to write out the waivers entirely, or, or for that matter, to suggest that the legislature would be involved in a very, very narrow question like, should, should in the context of you know, medical debt advice for, not, for bilingual people, should the otherwise lawyer requirement that lawyers do all of that be relaxed to allow non-lawyers to do some of it with lawyer oversight? I mean, I, I do not, understand this authority of the legislature to extend that far into what I understand to be the Supreme Court's authority to regulate. So I, I think we've got to find a way to state this principle and understand that it's going to have to get um, fleshed out in, in, uh, in the days ahead as opposed to writing a set of rules now that, that are waived. Justice Tucker? Thank you. May I ask for some clarification on uh, issue number four here, that entities participating in the sandbox should, should be subject to the same rules governing licensees of the, of the state bar. Um, my question goes to, um, Mary, you made the point that our current rules um, affect individual lawyers and don't say much about responsibility of entities. So I'm not quite clear what it means to subject sandbox entities to the same rules um, as rules that don't address entities' responsibility. Does this mean that the individuals in a sandbox who are providing legal services are subject to the same rules as lawyers would be? Unless, of course, there's some exception written into it so that, for example, the individuals providing medical debt 
counseling would have an attorney client uh, obligation to, uh, I don't know, exercise competence and uh, not negotiate with away rights without the client's uh, authorization and um, protect, protect confidentiality and all those sorts of things. Is that what we mean by number four? Or do we mean something completely different? Uh, I, I believe that the way you just described it is how it would, it would work. But um, Bridget, I don't know if you want to add to that. Yes, I think that's right. And we, we added a little footnote there, um, footnote three, if you want to scroll down. It's an example of a statute that does try to get at what we're trying to get here. There's a statute that says law corporations need to be bound by the statutes and the rules. So it would be something akin to what's already in the um, business and professions code, um, you know, that applies to law corporations. There's a part of it that it talks about law corporations. And, and so it would be a similar um, concept. Does that make sense? Well, I've never, I, I don't know anything about how 6167 is applied in practice. So I didn't understand what the footnote. Oh, I see. <laughs> I just, I, we were just trying to show that there are statutes that do try to get at this concept and that we can clarify as we, as we go, um, how that might happen. I know we're teeing up a discussion for, you know, responsible individuals. And I think the framework that you just described is, is a way that it could work. But um, do you think we should clarify that in this resolution, how it might be applied? I think if everybody understands what the resolution intends, uh, that you don't have to change the language. But since I didn't, I asked the question. And so I, I appreciate the answer. I'm not asking for any changes to the language that can always be addressed later when we write a report. Um, but I, I just wondered what, what was meant. So thank you for your for your response. Sure. You know, one one other thing I wanted to clarify before I move on to back to Wendy's point. I, I uh, my vision for this is I don't think there's any reason that with respect to both of these when we're talking about specified rules that we would we would get to a discussion where we could say up front like this is the range of rules that the sandbox you know that the um, working group recommend are on the table I guess. So to speak, you know, and I'm not sure, John, if that's how they do it in Utah, but I can envision to say, okay, let's go through the rules that we think could be implicated. We can list those up front. And then the, you know, kind of akin to what you saw in the um, example that we gave for the, um, now I can't remember what the name of the group is. You just talked about it, but the, the, um, the applicant. Holy Cross. Yes. Holy Cross. Um, you can see how, okay, now based on what they want to do, we will only waive this rule because this is the rule that they are, you know, that they're struggling with. You know, so it would almost be like there would be a broad range that as I don't think I don't think we're gonna we're ready for that discussion today. But my vision is eventually as we're trying to get through these parts, we could as a working group decide on the range of rules that might be waived in the sandbox. And then the more specific um, determination can be made according to principles that the legislature and the court and you know whoever else kind of agree like this is the process for which the regulator would make the determination and the recommendation as to whether the specific rules would be waived or not so i just wanted to to put a little bit more meat on the bones of what will happen eventually um, as far as the discussions that can be had and the and the recommendations that can be made uh eric Bridget, this is just, I have a follow-up question. If I'm interpreting four correctly, and, and this is maybe just a simple way of what was already said, if I apply to the regulatory sandbox, I'm Holy Cross, um, I'm requesting a waiver from certain rules, that list could be prescribed or not, but then I'm implicitly accepting the other rules through my application, that the, the process that, that brings me into this, that essentially triggers the, the rules applying to me is the, is the you know, application, and, and then if it's granted. So that, that we're just saying as a default, whatever you don't request a waiver from, whatever that list is, the rest of it applies to you. Is, is, am I understanding that right? Yes. And Randy, if you wanted to jump into, maybe you can do a better job than I can as, as explaining the footnote that, but um, uh, as far so, as, yeah. Yeah, I offered that to Bridget as an example, and, and I'll give another example as well, where it's completely true that the, uh, professional conduct standards and the rules of professional conduct and the State Bar Act 
apply generally to individual licensees, uh, attorneys. Uh, they also can apply to entities and the law corporation rules um, and the statutes uh, require the law corporation to abide by certain standards that are very similar to what a, an individual lawyer himself or herself would have to abide by. And the law corporation, unlike uh, a law firm that is not incorporated, is actually certified by the state bar. And so if the law corporation fails to abide by a standard reflecting the rules of the state bar act, then the enforcement hook that the state bar has is to involuntarily revoke their certification as a law corporation. And since law firms generally are not uh, regulated in that manner, you don't have uh, application of the rules to law firms writ large. We don't have a, a law firm discipline. It's been something that's been looked at over the years, but we don't have that. But a law corporation is certified and the statute reflects that we can hold the law corporation to conduct standards with the penalty being that their uh, status as a certified law corporation can be revoked. I said I'd give a second example. Uh, the Office of Professional Competence administers the regulation of certified lawyer referral services. One of the rules governing a certified lawyer referral service is rule 3.829 publicity paragraph B provides that any publicity by a lawyer referral service must comply with the California rules of professional conduct and any other legal requirements. Again, a lawyer referral service is not an individual lawyer licensee, might be a nonprofit, might be a bar association sponsor program, might be a for-profit operation, that engages in online uh, lawyer referrals for a profit. Uh, but those entities are subject to the rules governing lawyer advertising in the same manner that lawyers themselves are. And while a lawyer might be disciplined under the analysis that an LRS, a lawyer referral service, is advertising on their behalf, and so you can discipline the lawyer, the hook or enforcement against the LRS is if they engage in advertising that's contrary to the rules of professional conduct, then 3.829B is violated, and that would give a basis to rope, rope their certification as a lawyer referral service. And in California, unless you're certified, you cannot engage in lawyer referral activity. And so, again, just two examples where um, we have precedent for applying attorney conduct standards, which normally apply to individuals, to entities, law corporations, LRSs. And as Eric was saying, this is really just the segue to the, to the aspect of the sandbox that John emphasized, that if you're trying to engage in innovative delivery systems, then you might have to waive certain uh, requirements to test those, but you have to have the foundation of that, which is you have to be bound by something. And entities ordinarily are not bound by the rules unless you're a law corp, unless you're an LRS. And so when you enter the sandbox, as Eric said, the default is you comply with all of them. And as John says, you apply to waive certain things so that we can test your delivery system. And um, being an entity, um, you know, isn't a bar to that. We have the examples of law corporations and LRSs uh, already in California law. Okay, Justice Tucker. So that collection of answers was helpful. Thank you, especially Randy, for those examples. Um, I have a question about whether adding some language would be consistent with what the sponsors of number four intend, um, because it's not clear to me whether or not it is, but probably if, if this is what you intend, it would be helpful to say so. So after we say entities participating in the sandbox, the question is, should we add the language and all persons engaged in providing legal services through the sandbox? Comma, whether or not they are lawyers, comma. Yeah, that's exactly, so my question is, is this what you intend because um, I think Randy's example makes clear that that number four makes sense in a more limited way, even without this added language and even without intending this, but then it would just be that the sandbox entity has an obligation 
with regard to its lawyers obeying the rules of professional conduct because the rules of professional conduct constrain what lawyers can do. But are we trying to say, uh, and I thought from what Mary said earlier that we were, that not just lawyers providing legal services in the sandbox, but also non-lawyers providing legal services in the sandbox are supposed to comply with these rules. So my proposed amendment is really a question, not a proposal. I know there's not even a, um, you know, a motion pending, but I just, that's, that's, my, that's my question. Uh, can, I just wanna, before we move to other comments, I'd like to have anyone who wants to respond to Justice Tucker's suggestion. I think I could probably take a stab at that. Um, it, I guess this is a little bit the, the, I think of this as the barista question. And we've, we've um, you know, talked about that a bit. If Starbucks, you know, is going to deliver its product, it's consistent, you know, latte, it takes on a responsibility to train, you know, those baristas to, to a certain standard and deliver that le at that level. And it's Starbucks that, you know, we think of as accountable for that, not necessarily the individual. And I and I, I know that sounds like a trite example, but I think in the context of some of these one-to-many solutions for legal services, we may indeed have people that are, are are providing a pretty narrow element of the service, maybe even you know, with with some kind of computer support, who we wouldn't necessarily want to think of as the one that was responsible for the actual you know, standard of performance. It, it really would be the entity. So I don't know that I have a, a huge problem with your language, Justice Tucker, but I think it's important to appreciate it may be a bit broader in terms of how, how sandbox innovators would look at that and think about everybody, you know, up and down their, their staff of employees needing to be owning up to that standard of, of professional conduct. If I may respond to that um, particular point, and Justice Tucker's uh, edit. Um, first of all, I am extremely surprised to hear that there is any contemplation that a person providing legal services would not be responsible for their standard of, of performance. Um, that's unheard of when it comes to attorneys providing legal services and uh, would be a substantial departure from where we are today such that um, I, I could not support that. I don't think that would be a supportive of uh, uh, any consumer rights. But in any event, I, I like the change that Justice Tucker had made. Um, my concern would be addressed for three and four if the sentences ended up with other licenses of the bar, period, and then add a five to say, we were going to determine in the future uh, which rules and how uh, ought to be waived and when, um, if that's indeed what we're doing. Because if we really are not making those decisions now, but we really are going to evaluate that, um, then I think that would be a more accurate representation of what we're doing today. Um, okay, let me just say that, uh, Wendy, your point that this would be a substantial departure from where we are today, that's not exactly true, of course, because right now, staff, you know, non-attorneys in law firms or law organizations, they are not actually held to the standards that lawyers are held. The rules don't apply to staff members right now. So actually, number four, this, this would be a substantial departure it, 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 to, ha to have this language as, I'm not taking, a, a suggesting whether it's this proposed language that's proposed amendments good or bad, but I just wanna point out that this, that language would be a substantial departure from where we are today and not what we currently require in, in uh, law firms and law organizations now. Um, Andrew uh, Tuft. Uh, just really quickly, I think the focus on this language of three and four for me is um, what is the ramification um, for either a lawyer or the entity uh, violating, um, we'll just call it the rules of professional conduct. So I read three to say, although you're a lawyer, you're currently a lawyer, licensee of the State Bar of California, and you're participating in the sandbox, you are not absolved of your obligation to comply with the State Bar Act and the rules of professional conduct. And if you were to violate those obligations, while operating in the sandbox, you are still subject to discipline through 
the Office of Chief Trial Counsel and State Bar Court. And then I agree with Randy, when we turn to four, entities are not disciplined, but you could have your sandbox badge and certification revoked if the entity fails to comply. So that is the quote unquote threat of violating. And so the language here of adding all persons engaged to provide, I don't know that we could scoop those non-lawyers up and bring any disciplinable ramifications to them for failing to comply. And so I think John has it correct. The entity is gonna to have to be responsible for those non-lawyer employees to, they're gonna to have to have a really good training and oversight um, protocol because if any of those individuals screw up, it's the entity that's on the line and they might be removed from the sandbox for failure of any of those persons uh, who are now being described in this added language. So long-winded way of saying, I think for, in my mind, three and four work as drafted if we are focusing on the ramifications for violation. Uh, John? I wonder about Wendy's suggestion of maybe adding a five here. I, I would think about doing it in terms of leaving three and four the way they are. And with respect, Justice Tuker, not, not using that language that you, you suggested, but then having five be and a rather explicit statement about the intention to work through the waiver, you know, the specifics of waiver and the mechanics of waiver at a later date, just so that piece isn't somehow or another being misinterpreted at this juncture. Do you, is there specific language that you could um, suggest? Well, I guess, I guess just to, to spitball it, I'd say we leave four, three and four the way they're written in black here and say, you know, as to any waiver, as to the waiver actions, or as to the waiver possibility listed above, uh, uh, that should occur through, you know, appropriate collaboration between the regulatory agencies or, or between the court and the legislature, however it is that we want to say that as needed. And um, I don't know, I'm just spitballing. I, I guess I think we need to make it clear that it's also about getting to the specifics of what exactly can be waived at a later date. Sorry, I'm not doing better with the language. Maybe Greg can bail me out. Yeah, let's, we'll think about it. Greg? I don't know if I can bail you out, Jim. <laughs> but I, something that came up, I'm just thinking about Wendy's comments as well as Andrew's. Um, I, I'm, I guess I'm concerned about the, the term uh, rules governing other licensees because there are, obviously the, the rules of professional conduct, we have certain rules of court and and of course we have the state bar act and um you know in terms of obtaining authority to waive those things it's going to be different depending on what source of regulation we're talking about uh, the rules of professional conduct are the supreme court's rules uh and they cannot be waived without the supreme court this, this the legislature is responsible for regulating uh attorney conduct in the practice of law through the state bar act so I don't know, it, it, I guess it gets to, this, to the idea of what exactly are we talking about in terms of the scope of the sandbox and if we are contemplating not only a waiver of rules that, the, that really fall within the ambit of the court and also uh, talking about restrictions that are sourced by legislation, uh, we probably need to, to capture that here because I think same rules is just a, a bit too generic. So, um, yeah, so, so I think we should uh, probably amend uh, that language to instead of the same rules, it should be the same rules and um, statutes, right? Laws. Laws, okay. Mm -hmm. Same rules and laws. And that same would be, same change would be made for number four rules and laws. And then I, here's a possible um, amended language for number five. What about something like the working group will separately consider the scope and mechanism of possible rule uh, and or statute or, or law waivers, uh, period. So separately consider, meaning we're not doing it now. Seems like an improvement. 
So, uh, Mimi, it's the working group will separately consider the scope and mechanism of possible rule and or statute waivers or uh, I'll, I'll leave it statute now if someone wants to change it. Sorry, this the working group will separately consider the scope and mechanism, and mechanism of, of possible rule and or statute waivers. It was a uh, rule should be singular rule and or statute waivers. And, and what I mean by mechanism goes to Wendy's point about, you know, legislative involvement, obviously, if it's if we're talking about amending and, and to Greg's point, if we're talking about waiving anything to do with statutory requirements, then um, it's certainly I, I would think that we would need legislative authority to do that. If I may just speak to the legislative piece since um, since I'm the designee from the legislature and I've gotten very clear directives in this area to share with the working group that I, I continue to try to do. The position of the legislature is that statutes can't be waived by a regulatory group without that authority. They can only be waived by the legislature. The legislature has labor code provisions and business and professions code provisions, which they do, that govern this area. They cannot be waived by another mechanism uh, other than the legislature. So I, I don't mean to keep uh, being a broken record in this area, but it, it we lack, as a member, I, I lack that authority. That authority completely resides solely in the legislature. Um, and the, the court does not have the, except where it's unconstitutional, of course, um, doesn't have the authority just to simply decide that there is a waiver on an ad hoc basis of statutes that have been passed by the legislature, it, it just is not, would not be a lawful act. Can and I so, jump in, in response yeah. to Wendy's point just there? Mm -hmm. Because Wendy, you're raising a good one and I'd like to, to respond to it. Um, I think I share your view that the legislature, that, that there will be no waiving of statutes without legislative authorization. Where, uh, I may not, but where I'm not clear on what your on what your perspective is or how directly it comes from the legislature, is really more about when you talk about um, ad hoc waiver, um, the idea of the sandbox, which I think can be entirely consistent with legislative control over uh, statutes, because yes, the legislature has control over over the reach of its statutes, is that the legislature could say, for example, we authorize a sandbox, we authorize the regulators of the sandbox to, in appropriate circumstances, waive this particular statute or shortlist of statutes uh, under whatever circumstances or under their own you know, determination of when that's appropriate. I think uh, that's where um, we may have a, a difference of opinion, but I don't think there's anybody who thinks that the court or the bar or the sandbox authority can just authorize the waiver of statutes uh, without being expressly granted that authorization by the legislature. Justice Tukar, I agree with you. I agree that the legislature could indicate there's a, you know, write in a writer about whatever it wanted to uh, about uh, waiver in particular circumstances, um, as you've just described. I think the legislature could do that and that would be consistent. So I, I don't think we disagree about the ability of the legislature to do that or to divest themselves of, of of that to a certain degree, assuming that they take that action. Great, well, I don't wanna further um, waylay the discussion of these important issues, but I just wanted to jump in to address that because I really do think it's important that the legislature understand, that we understand that the sandbox entity can't go authorizing uh, waivers of statutes that the legislature has not itself expressly said can be waived through the sandbox. Right, good, Thank, thanks for that clarification, um, John. Mary, unless there's more conversation, I was just going to maybe put a motion on the table so that we could sure. uh, address this. And my motion would be that we uh, adopt three, four, and five as submitted, with the exception of the Justice Tucker clause um, about other persons. Um, and I'm, I guess, open to further discussion about that. My motion would be to to leave that part out uh, and move ahead without it. 
I'll second. There, okay. Discussion. It probably comes as no surprise that I would oppose that. Um, I think we need to, again, I would agree with the sentence ending at the bar on both three and four. And then uh, I like Justice Tuker's edits. I thought that they were appropriate. Um, and, uh, and I do appreciate having a number five. Any other comments? Okay, why don't we go ahead and vote on the uh, proposal that the motion that's been made to approve uh, three, four, and five as are shown on the screen here. Okay. So yeah, the motion is to adopt three, four, and five as drafted or and or revised in some cases. Okay, uh, Mary Baldwin? Yes. John Lund? Yes. Andrew Arruda? Yes. Judge Wendy Chang? Yes. Dan Grunfeld? Yes. Eric Helland? Yes. Wendy Musell? No. Jim Sandman? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Okay. Um, thanks, everybody, and thanks for all the comments and participation. I'm going to turn this I'm, over to. I'm sorry, Mary, not to be a procedural stickler, but was there a, a motion or a second on that? Because I think it does need to be reflected. And I'm if I missed it, well, I there really, was a really motion. John that. made the motion. And, and, and Eric Helen. Eric seconded. Sorry. Thank you. My bad. Continue. <laughs> okay, so now I'm going to turn the uh, committee meeting over to John Lund to move, move us through the rest of the agenda. I actually have a hearing uh, that was unilaterally moved by the court uh, in one of my matters, so I'm going to have to drop off at some point, but I will participate until I have to do that. Okay, just getting up the, the memo, which I, again, would like to say thanks to Randy and Bridget for putting together those materials for us. Um, the, the next subject to turn to, it would be, um, oh, shoot, I've got the wrong memo up. No, I don't. Here we go. Would be, it's, it, it's, uh, um, Sheet nine of 94 in the materials, and it would be 2B, discussion and possible action on a recommendation for proactive regulation and monitoring of sandbox providers, including reporting, monitoring, and audits. And then you'll see in the memo that there's been um, the, the uh, identification of the risks, which is, I think, uh, been pretty well listed and established before. The memo throws out three possible criteria for assessing risk. This would be at the front end as, you know, as the applicant comes in the door, we don't know yet anything about it other than what they describe as their proposed model. How do we categorize it? How do we think about what risk that particular model presents? Does the level of ownership by lawyers in the entity, you know, drive, guide us? Does the level of lawyer involvement in the product and service guide us? Does it depend on what the nature of the service provided is, for example? So those are the types of things. Uh, we've set out there the, the way the Utah Innovation Office is using those models, um, which you're all familiar with. I won't belabor at this point. Um, the one thing I did want to highlight is that as that evolved in Utah, it became clear we needed to have some, 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 some things fleshed out, for example, we didn't initially have this intermediary platform idea at all, but we had proposed uh, participants who really were really were not themselves providing legal services. Instead, they were acting as an intermediary between some consumer group, some particular market of consumers, and lawyers who would be providing those services. So we characterized. We, we decided that really deserved its different, its own separate categorization. Um, we also, as you see in those footnotes, footnotes, um, particularly footnote four, if you're talking about non-lawyers providing the services, one of the things that's important to think about is what is the level of lawyer involvement and how do you articulate that? And every applicant's got a little different idea about that, but uh, it'd be on, on page, uh, bottom of, well, top of page 10 of the PDF, uh, there is that 
footnote four indicating what lawyer involvement means in terms of guidance and oversight of the provider at the front end and regular spot checks of the providers doing the service. And then without lawyer involvement is, you know, this higher riskier thing, and at least the way we've categorized that. Um, the other thing to think about under this nature of service provided area that, that falls a little bit further down in the memo is just how involved is the service? You know, if, if obviously I think we'd all agree if somebody was accused of a capital felony, we would, we would, and they needed representation in court, we would never think that that was something somebody other than a very well-trained lawyer would do. In fact, many members of the bar would not take on that type of responsibility without appropriate qualifications. But at the other end of the spectrum, some of the things that the people who are not receiving any legal services at all right now really need is what we would all think of as very basic legal information. They might just need process information about what step to take and how to take that step. So you'll see here this, this chart that I think, Bridget, this is something that you developed. Um, you'll have to fill us in on where this came from. I don't recognize it. Yeah, but, I just, I just, it was a starting point for a, a discussion. Yeah. Yeah. So basically the more complicated, if you will, or sophisticated the legal advice is, uh, the, the higher the risk that, that might be perceived to exist with that. I'll give you one example on an application we're currently considering in Utah about immigration services. And it, the question is, is it just form completion? Is it just about filling out, you know, the right objective boxes about age and where, where are your parents from? And, you know, those kind of nuts and bolts facts, or is there something where you have to construct an argument for the person in order to make the case for them as, as an advocate in immigration? And the way one of our justices described it is, if there was a big open blank spot where you just had to fill in your argument, that would feel a lot more like giving what lawyers should be doing or who people are trained in that particular type of argument versus the, the filling out of the forms. And then somebody said, well, the real thing in, in immigration is you need to know which form to fill out in the first place. It's not about what the form is. It's about, you know, what sort of a, what sort of a visa this, should this person be seeking? So those are the kind of things that, that are, I guess, worth thinking about a little bit. Um, these, Bridget, I think these are the recommendations, really the way staff articulated them. So if it's all right, maybe you could walk us through these three recommendations the way you have these laid out. Sure. Um, you know, as after I after we posted this memo, I was thinking about this a little more, just just to kind of add something to the discussion here. You know, there could be another another uh, way of determining or, or assessing risk, I guess, a risk criteria. And I and I think in my attempt to try to simplify all of this, I may have dropped off which was a different model that the um, that IELTS has, the Institute for the Advancement of the American Legal System, the way that they suggest assessing risk has to do with the level of sophistication of, of the consumer, which I do think is important to talk about today somehow. Um, so I don't know, I mean, the way that, I, that I've that i teed this up is, I think the way that Utah has done it makes a lot of sense as a starting point. I don't know if we need to reinvent the wheel and my, based on the research that I've done and talking to people who are doing this or kind of developing it as you go, you start with this this table. Sorry, Mimi, do you mind scooting up a little bit back to the, um, keep going up, uh, that, that one, the service model. You know, just as a starting point, it seems like most likely the the, at least I think what you've experienced in Utah, and it seems to be at least a point of, probable contention that we are going to be testing in the sandbox is whether it makes sense to ultimately amend rule 5.4, which has to do with ownership. We're trying to find out is the level, you know, is it so risky to allow um, non-lawyer ownership in any level? Um, and so if you start with that service model as a starting point for assessing how much, um, basically how much risk are you going to assign to this entity and and therefore how much how much additional monitoring and data collection and you know um, scrutiny are these entities going to be given so you start with this as a risk assessment as soon as they turn in their application 
the first thing you're looking at is what is the degree of lawyer involvement. And then you can have these secondary questions. My understanding of the way Utah works is that then, as you can see from the attachment that we provided, they kind of go through this risk assessment. They say, okay, this is what you want to do. You have X percentage of lawyer involvement. We're going to assign you a moderate risk level. And then we're going to more specifically, based on what it is that you want to do, we'll tell you specifically what practice area you can do, what, um, what types of services you're going to allow people, you know, the, you, this entity to provide, like all of the very specific details and, and parameters around each applicant is laid out in the order. And so the, what we have for the recommendations um, is as a starting point to go like with what Mimi said, uh, Mimi, sorry, can you move it back down to the recommendations? To start with the, the uh, sorry, up, yeah. Um, to start with the risk assessment as Utah has it based on the service model. And then um, as you'll see in number two, the level of data collection and the monitoring of the sandbox is going to increase. The scrutiny will increase based on the level of risk that is being assigned to the, to the applicant. And then the authorization orders are the, are the place where the regulator can really customize specifically, and these are all public documents too. So, you know, as, as we'll talk about later, you know, the level of what kinds of disclosures will be required for consumers, how public will this information be, how will people understand what it is that they are and are not permitted to do would be set forth in a more customized way in the authorization orders. So that's a long way of saying that's what these recommendations are meant to just to start as a starting point kind of based off of Utah. And then we can also flesh out if you think there are additional criteria for risk that you want to include in your recommendations or a different way that you want to go. But this, I thought I would just put this out as a starting point for a discussion. Yeah, and if I could, I could just piggyback on that for a minute. Thanks, Bridget. Um, Mimi, if you'd scroll down to, I've got it at PDF page 16 of 94. Uh, it's, it's part of the order on Holy Cross Ministries, the way this came out from the Supreme Court of, of Utah. Um, maybe you don't have the attachments in there. There you go. Give me one second. I'm just going to try to, uh, would you know what page? Yeah, I it's in there. It would be, just scroll down a few pages. It's not too far. Whoa, 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 a little bit further up, a little bit further up. Oh, up. Not down, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it should have a page number at the bottom for this section. Oh, uh, it would be page one of the order. Okay, so this would be it. Let me just. This is the executive summary. It's go, go up from where you are. Oh, up. Yeah, it's the first document in the package. Got there you it. go. Okay. This one. Okay. There you go. Right there. Right there. So this is what Bridge is talking about. The way that this was ordered, Holy Cross was authorized to offer legal services in the following models. And that's tying back to that list of models. One is, and it's the non-lawyer provider with lawyer involvement. In this instance, there's no issue about lawyer ownership and non-lawyer ownership. This is, this is just about non-lawyers providing the service. Now, you'll see there's a listing specifically the type of services that non-lawyers can provide, and it kind of graduates up, one, two, three, four, five. Each one of those you could see is a little bit more, we would think, involved, right? One's legal information, process assistance. Number five would be negotiation directly with the consumer. Remember, this is about medical debt collection only, okay, um, as far as the, the, the scale. And then there's a pretty detailed list there of what the lawyer involvement has to be, and you can see those six items that are being called for that if I were the lawyer affiliated with Holy Cross Ministries doing this, I would consider myself obliged to make sure that we comply with this court order in those specifics. And then on the question of the scope of services, you'll see in sub two there, they're only authorized to provide those services in those four discrete categories. And as to immigration and public benefits, the footnotes go on to make it clear that it's only as regards Medicaid benefits and other things that are specific to the issue of their medical expenses. So that's the narrowing of the scope or the, the articulation of the scope of what Holy Cross Ministries is allowed to do. I just wanted to show you how that kind of applies uh, when, when, you, when you bring it into bear on a particular example. So that's probably enough about me and Bridget talking. Maybe we could open it up for discussion. I suppose the 
Good, Eric, you got your hand up already. Go for it. This is just a quick clarifying question. Um, did you envision this also, the risk assessment also triggering what kind of follow-up data would be collected and kind of the evaluation? Because it strikes me that, you know, as, as we've said before, it's often going to be very hard to evaluate this going in, you know, maybe for a, one that you consider low risk, simply having to provide, you know, data and then, uh, you know, feel like a fire alarms approach would work. And then maybe you want sort of, we want more, uh, intensive scrutiny or different data collection or something at a, a higher level for ones that are higher risk. I don't know if this is the right place to add that, but it just struck me that, you know, that the entity will continue, the sandbox will continue to evaluate the entity for some period of time, TBD, after their entry. Right. So I'm going to have to ask Mimi to scroll down. This, this order identified Holy Cross's model as a moderate risk deal. And so what that means is if you refer to this is going to be page 11 of the of the manual, which is the third attachment to the order. Uh, after fee sharing with non-lawyers, the next box is for non-lawyer provider with lawyer involvement. It's the next one down, Mimi. So this right here is what Holy Cross needs to do. They report that general data on a monthly basis about the number of people served, geographic area, and so forth. And then as to the specific consumer services by the non-lawyers, the measures involved in this instance are a satisfactory legal expert review of a representative selection of the work being done by these non-lawyers. In this instance, they've got to submit the first 20 examples for a review by an experienced lawyer. And then we have the right to ask for more information. They also have to provide non-financial outcome data, financial outcome data, and so forth, you can see this. So that that's this data feedback that's coming. You smile at me, Eric. <laughs> no, no, I'm just wondering what you do for the people that are high risk. Uh, I mean, that's a, <laughs> yeah. that's a great, I, I mean, that's a lot of information. I feel like you have a really good picture. Um, and this is also the part where I confess I didn't actually read through all of the Holy Cross application. I missed this. Um, okay. But yeah, that's, um, I mean, this was kind of what I was thinking of as, you know, we would, you know, request something like randomized control trials for the high risk. But um, you know, that's a, that's a pretty high level of scrutiny in terms of what you're asking from them. Uh, that seems good you know, to me. You know, I, I guess, you know, to, to answer the concerns being raised in public comment about concerns for consumers, we want to find out if it's not yeah. working right. And, and this, is the whole, this is the whole mechanism for doing that. Just for one second, just to put, put this on the record, um, you know, this is kind of a, a randomized control trial where you're, you know, basically having people evaluate a randomly chosen. That's kind of the gold standard in social science for program evaluation. So uh, I stand impressed. Wendy. I had some questions about some of the um, areas. So for example, uh, there was some of the terms used was unnecessary legal service or pays an inappropriate amount for legal services. And um, I wondered how those would be defined um, and utilized in this evaluation. Uh, in terms, I also had questions about, um, well, uh, in objections to footnote one, number two, with the measure being relative to the experience the consumer would have had absent legal services provided. If our evaluative process is against you know, not providing any services at all, what sort of evaluative process really is that? I think the data you get back, you know, uh, garbage in, garbage out. If you don't have a, a, a baseline of competency, then if you're trying to determine is this entity competent, um, I'm not sure what that actually looks like. The other question I, I have is about, um, would consumers be provided or be required? And, and I think we should consider this. This is a, I, I think there's some great pieces in here about how to evaluate it. And I think uh, that are very valuable. Would a consumer be informed of that at the time of hiring that entity that, hey, this is what we see and this is what they have to do, et cetera. And in a manner that 
the consumers can understand because I can tell you attorneys won't even read this. <laughs> you know, if you get a 20 page, like check the box thing or, you know, name, I'm sure all of us did this this week. We probably didn't read through this whole thing. So are we considering some sort of um, con easy consumer communication that indicates, uh, you know, what the sandbox participant has to go through and report and et cetera. Thank you. Let, let me try to address a couple of those things you raised. On, on the items one through four on, on page uh, three of the memo, my understanding is that we've pretty well set that up, uh, that we're now trying to figure out what our recommendations would be for assessing that risk. But to your question about how you find that out, we, we've been working on the form that a lawyer would fill out who's reviewing the service provided by the non-lawyer, you know, these, these audits or these reviews of the legal services. And absolutely one of the questions, you know, being put to the lawyers who are doing those audits is did this consumer receive an unnecessary legal service or you know is there something about the legal service they they received that uh was uh, inappropriate or inaccurate so that that's part of that whole sort of mechanism especially in the context of non-lawyer providers um let's see i'm trying to remember if there was another a concern that you were raising um I think on? one of them, John, I was thinking it might be helpful if you can describe, I know we've talked about this. I think there's a confusion between, and it's it's just confusing, about the standard compared to nothing standard. Oh, right. Because it's different than the professional liability, civil liability standard, Wendy. This is just for purposes of, in, maybe I think it's better if you describe it, John, because I, I struggle to articulate it very well. Well, I mean, I, I think this really goes to the heart of the access to justice question, right? So take those, take those, um, those bilingual people dealing with the medical debt issue. Um, they they don't have the ability to hire a lawyer on an hourly basis. Uh, they may not be in a situation where there's an attorney's provision that would work in their favor if someone took on their case. So whether they do or don't have a good case or not there isn't necessarily going to be a lawyer available to them to take on the defense of the creditor or the, the debt collection problem for them um, unless there's a pro bono lawyer. And I guess the premise here is that there isn't enough pro bono lawyers to cover the need. So the, the question, at least as we would look at a, a proposal like this is, what is this consumer's alternative? If not this, um, this non-lawyer at Holy Cross Ministries that's trained to do this and is doing it in this holistic way, what will they do or what, what will they have available to them? And if you would say, well, we need to test the risk to them of using Holy Cross Ministries against the risk of using a very well-paid, well-trained lawyer, you know, the answer would probably be, well, it's not gonna be as good to work with Holy Cross Ministries as to work with a lawyer that, you know, might charge a few hundred dollars an hour to help them. But that's, that's not their alternative. That's the heart of the access to justice problem is their alternative is not that lawyer. It is fend for yourself on the internet, you know, or ask your friends and neighbors. And that's this then becomes the, the appropriate comparison, at least for this particular application is, you know, how would this fare relative to what they're otherwise gonna have available? Um, if, if I can just add something though there, because I think I think maybe this is where the um, where this conversation maybe goes sideways is um, John. What you're talking about are sort of the assessing the risk the the risk at the front end when you're reviewing the application. Is this is this somebody that we should let into the sandbox? But what but what you're not talking about is using that as the discipline standard the discipline standard of whether or not you're performing um, appropriately for the consumers, whether you're harming the consumers is, is not this as compared to you getting nothing else. Um, it is, as we were talking about earlier, right, applying the sort of the, the ethical obligations and the sort of discipline standards that we would otherwise apply, for example, typically in, uh, in the attorney discipline system. 
That's a great clarification. Thank you for that. Very Eric. good. That's what I was trying to say to you. Yes. Eric, what do you have? Are you next or is Wendy next? Uh, I, I'm not sure who was next. Okay, I'll take it. <laughs> um, I, John, I was just going to flip yours around because I thought that was well put, right? That, you know, for the purposes of risk evaluation, we're asking them, as I understand it, to state their business model. If the business model is we're reaching out to people who do not have legal representation at the moment, then the risk to those people is very different. The other one that's in the Utah sandbox is, um, and this is just a name I can't get out of my head, Hello Divorce, um, which is really directly competing with attorneys. It's trying to offer uh, essentially lower cost, uh, uh, um, uh, no contest divorces. And there you would flip it around and say your business model is dictating that, that you are trying to offer a quality of service, but at a lower price as good as someone uh, uh, is um, uh, who would seek out an attorney in this uh, event. And so I, I, I think it's really critical to the access of justice that we kind of have this standard because in some sense, you know, we want to encourage those people who are trying to find a way to offer you know, underserved uh, populations. And I think the second thing is, I actually think it probably is easier to evaluate in that, look, there are a lot of people with no representation in debt collection cases. It would be relatively easy to collect that data, see how they're doing and see how Holy Cross uh, uh, um, participants are doing and, and compare those uh, sort of going forward. So I, I actually think, you know, once we have people stating in their business model what they're trying to do, you know, we kind of have clear comparison groups often with data. So yeah, I, I thought that was well put. Wendy. I just wanted to add on to what John was saying that from the perspective of someone who is seeing that literal impact of people walking in with no lawyers, that is the appropriate standard because their alternative really is no one. And I wanted to also focus on one point here. I know I've raised it before and I'm sorry. I think I did it before you joined Wendy. So for your benefit, I'm gonna to try to say it again. Um, all of the public comment people we, that we heard from, I mean, not all of them, but the vast majority of them, they're all talking about plaintiffs. No one's talking about the defendants here. There are as many defendants who are unrepresented in court as there are plaintiffs. And the defendants have no option anywhere unless they can find someone who is, they're not even, they don't even have the option of choosing whether or not they got sued, right? It's completely involuntary. And they are so, I mean, so I think when we talk about who we're trying to help, you need to think about the people who, that side of it, who right now are absolutely not being served at all unless they can find someone who's willing to take it on pro bono. And that's just not happening from what I see. Andrew, did you have something? No, it was a thought that then near the end of uh, the last bit of what Eric was saying, he covered well. Okay, Justice Tucker, you have some input into this question about criteria for assessing risk. Do you wanna share with the group your, your, your thinking about that or your ideas about that? Um, I had some reaction to using the chart out of the Utah model. Is that what you're asking about? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. So I had two points about it and maybe if we could scroll down a little further. Um, I note that the two points that are high risk here are both uh, services being provided entirely without lawyer involvement. And I know that our task force intends to discuss whether or not we should allow into the sandbox uh, providers who operate entirely without attorney involvement. And I think that there are a variety of views on that. So I just wanted to uh, confirm that we're all of the same view that if we decide to go forward with what I believe the memo recommends, which is adopting Utah's innovation manual chart that we're all looking at now as our uh, primary risk management chart, we're not sub rosa agreeing that the, san that the scope of the sandbox needs to include uh, entities that don't have lawyers at all. We're just saying if that's going to be included within the scope, we would at least call those high risk enterprises and subject them to a different um, reporting standard pursuant to to this chart. Um, so it's it's really just trying to put a pin in the fact that that's not a, a decision that we're making in, in the proposed recommendation. 
That's my first point. My second point is um, actually harkens back to the last time that I remember we discussed this topic. Um, some people were making the point that um, some areas of law have much higher stakes than others. For example, if you're in deportation proceedings, your um, you know the stakes of the representation are a lot higher than if we're talking about um, a breach of contract, or if you're um, you know if you stand to lose your lose your kids to your ex spouse, or you do or don't get a restraining order. Those kinds of um, decisions have particularly high stakes. And we talked about whether that ought to be incorporated in our assessment of risk. Um, and I know that this chart we're looking at that Utah uses doesn't go off on that kind of a metric. Um, and it's not quite the same metric as a, a page or two later, the information Bridget was just talking us uh, through, although there might be some similarity. So I wondered whether um, we wanted to consider uh, a rule that said that, you know, we would start with this chart on page three as our metric, but where the um, circumstances, where the stakes were particularly high for, for, the, for the representation that a model on my way. tends to offer, um, th th that would up the ante one. You'd go from being uh, low, low risk to being moderate risk if you're in one of these uh, sort of more dangerous areas of, of service provision. Um, and then relatedly, um, if you're operating in an area where the consumer is particularly unlikely to get good feedback about whether um, the services provided were good. And the thing that sprang immediately to mind was if you get somebody to write your will or do your estate plan, um, nobody's going to know until you're dead and gone whether or not they did a decent yeah. job of it. Um, whereas if you get somebody to represent you in a, um, in a negotiation with a medical debt provider, you get at least some feedback when you hear whether or not your medical debt was reduced, eliminated, or um, in fact, the, uh, the counterparty said, well, since you're bothering us, we actually have found seven more things we're going to throw at you. Um, so that would be another sort of metric for saying, um, normally we'd call this low risk, but because it's something where the consumer will be particularly unlikely to have insight into the, into the quality of the service provided, we might call it uh, moderate risk instead. I don't know if those complications are worth the, worth the candle, whether they're worth complicating thing, you know, complicating the approach with. Um, but because um, that represents something we previously talked about in part, I wanted to at least raise it as a possibility. Well, and Justice Tucker, I have a, a question about the first of those that you raised, um, the idea that there may we may not have these non anything that has no lawyers involved. The, the, the wording and the, the way Bridget drafted that first recommendation is that it'd be to implement a risk assessment process based on the Utah offices uh, model is that based on sufficiently loose or, or I don't have any problem with the wording at all as long okay. as we all agree that we're not making a sub rosa decision I want sure. us to be clear and I want those who hear us to be clear that we're not sure. making that decision if if we accept the recommendation as it's drafted and then I think the other thing I would ask you is if if, if you wanted to incorporate those other two points about the type of the legal problem involved um, in, in here, could there be an item four that would or that would simply say in instances where X, Y, and Z are the, are the conditions, uh, the, the the risk assessment you know should be should be notched up or in, increased? Would, would that could we do that in some sort of a catch-all way? Sure. Okay. Wendy, uh, just following on Justice Tucker's um, comments, I think particularly with the service model chart, it anticipates that certain things would be passed. Um, for example, it has software uh, providers, intermediate pla intermediary platform, um, non-lawyer ownership, uh, et cetera. So uh, no lawyer involvement. I think it puts the cart before the horse. Um, I, I would feel more comfortable if there was language that says 
the concept of assessing risk as to low, low, moderate, moderate, and high, I have no problem with that. It's the assumption that there would be any, we haven't gotten to this point yet, as to what the decisions will be made about um, the service models uh, and what would be permitted or not permitted. And so my concern is that they're similar to what Justice Tucker was articulating, is that if we have a vote on this that says it's going to be based on um, based on to me says you're looking at the model, you replicate it. Um, it doesn't say that we're going to be looking at the factors that of risk and determining um, what the categories might be for the service model and how we might integrate some of these thoughts into it. I think those are two different things. Um, and so that's my concern is that um, some of these decisions uh, are controversial and have not yet been made. So, so I, I, as I understand that, it sounds to me like your concern would be that someone or other, by referencing that chart with those service-based models, it'd be read as an endorsement that this kind of model, that kind of model is going to be allowed. Is that, is that what you're concerned about? I think that's very fair. I, I do wanna say, I, I appreciate having a evaluative process and an evaluative process that's understandable, such as low, low, moderate, moderate, and high, and what that might mean and providing very clear definitions and very clear definitions of service models. I think that's great um, and usable, personally. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I think that's uh, one that consumers can understand and others I think can understand so, so long as there's very clear definitions. Right. But you articulated exactly my concern is that, you know, basically, uh, if we're using an evaluative process that we're not uh, of, of a box of how to evaluate something, we haven't already filled in the box, <laughs> Got it. so to speak. Dan, what do you have? Um, I was, uh, <clears throat> I was going to make the same point that Justice uh, made regarding the sub, making clear that uh, there's no supposed effort with respect to the chart on, on, um, on bottom of page three. Uh, but I think more significantly, I want to strongly support um, her other point um, and offer a, just a point of information in the context of the civil Gideon movement, which was an attempt to um, get um, court, to get uh, government funded attorneys in civil, some civil cases, there were four areas of laws that were identified as being particularly risk and where people's rights were in the civil context, particularly important and the ramifications of it going sideways were particularly um, dangerous. That was bankruptcy, housing, immigration, and some aspects of family law. Um, looking at the work done in the context of civil Gideon uh, and other similar efforts and sort of identifying those areas of a law and incorporated into our risk analysis um, strikes me as something that uh, we can relatively easily undertake. And in terms of ratcheting the, 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 as we move forward, if we ultimately decide um, that um, those areas of law um, will ratchet up the level of review and expectations. That's something that I think uh, uh, would do well for the people we're trying to protect. Thank you for that. I guess what I'm wondering about, Bridget, in the context of our time, I, I, I know we're, we're running, we got about 12 minutes left, is that right? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm wondering about, and this is a, a bit of taking a cue from Justice Tucker, if we could take this input that we've received and, and do some revision to these three recommendations with that input um, to be able to put it in a form that maybe will we'll, uh, we'll fly when we next convene. Um, and my thought on that would be then we could at least spend a few minutes talking about the final topic in the memo before we, uh, before we have to adjourn. But I take, your, I take your thoughts on that, Bridget, since you put this together. Sure, no, I was gonna suggest that. And I'm, I'm wondering from a process standpoint, I actually, don't know if this is like something that you do, but I would, I really would like to have something out of this group to present to the working group. And so I'm wondering if it's, a pro if it's appropriate procedurally for us to 
suggest some revisions based on this conversation, circulate it to the group from staff as recommend, you know, and get input so that we can kind of in writing come up with something sure. that we reach a consensus on to present to the main group. I just don't want well, to put this off and not have something to present sure. to the main group. That's my well, only I, I know a couple of things. One, one, I think there is at least one instance where we just kind of fleshed something out after a subcommittee meeting and then presented it to the entire committee, you know, with that, with that, uh, those additional input incorporated. And it was, I think, presented as a, you know, near consensus or you know not 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 in the sense of everybody agreed but you know this is what largely reflected the the thinking of the of the subcommittee that's that's an approach the other approach is to take something to this to the main working group that is you know our 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 working draft you know but isn't the final version i i would probably defer to justice tuker about which direction she'd prefer to see us go on this I would love to see you bring a recommendation, and I think it's totally fine if we leave today's meeting with sort of uh, input for for staff and committee chairs to make further revisions, and then to present it as your best uh, attempt to crystallize the sense of the meeting. We won't pretend that it was, uh, you know, specifically endorsed, but I think that's good enough to to bring. So. Um, I don't know if we're finished on this topic or if there are other comments people want to make about changes they'd like to see to these recommendations before we go to the next issue. But I, I do think it's uh, both very good to bring something to the main meeting for, for the main group to hopefully be able to vote on um, and that it se seems that we're close enough and that it's fine to follow up, you know, after the meeting. Great. Great. I just for a couple points of clarification and I first of all I just think all of these comments are great and the feedback is so great because this is as you can imagine it's just a lot to take in and to try to present in a way that we can all have a discussion about so this has been really helpful to me as far as figuring out how to how to frame it and I think I can do that my went where I got a little stuck before and I just would like a brief amount of feedback before we switch the next, last topic is um the way I framed this recommendation was let's start with, and I, I don't think we have to use the term Utah, Utah model, like just based on a, a service model um, and um, even as the primary risk assessment table, right? You start with this, looking at this and saying, based on this first little chart, whatever the categories are, but based on your service model alone, we're going to assign you to low, moderate, or high to start. And then I, I what I don't know is how it would work either like in a matrix or if it's my, my thought was maybe it's just better to say you should also consider these factors like the sophistication of the client, the practice area, to, you know, the stakes that you know involved and the nature of the service involved. Those should also be considered when making a final determination as to risk. But I can't, I don't, I can't picture the matrix that would be used in that sense. So I guess I, I don't know if anyone has a sense of we can take that more on a case-by-case -case basis, utilizing those factors, or, or um, if you think it's better to try to develop some kind of broader matrix. Eric. Are you really just thinking kind of what would a large two by two look like where you are, you're sort of putting these across with the different case types and the different. Yes, but my brain doesn't work like that. I, do, I, I can't, I, I can't figure that out. Mine does feel free to reach out. Okay. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. And Thank I also you. think just to, as a working principle that, you know, considering those things may warrant increasing the, the, the classification uh, of risk because of those things as a, as a, as a, uh, as a word version of the solution versus a chart might, might be might be sufficient. But if Eric can if Eric can help us master something, Char I'm charts I got, it. charts I got. I, I think yeah, I think we can. I I, I can see something that that might I love it. Sort of capture both of these. So, okay. Any other comments about this subject uh, before we talk for a brief moment about tools? Okay. So the tool project. I call it, I'm being somewhat sure, but proactive regulation tools. Um, you know, yeah, tools are good. Let's use them all. It's a good list. You know, that's kind of the general tone of, of what we're putting here. Um, and and I, I don't know that anybody would necessarily, well, I don't think we're necessarily saying 
yes, let's vote that all of these should be used or, you know, any particular item. It's just develop a good, robust, proactive approach. Um, and I think the other thing to be clear about there is there, this is the proactive approach to regulating, but it doesn't necessarily finish the conversation about compliance and enforcement, right? There's, there's this sort of, we're going to do all of this, even if you're a good actor, but there's going to be some next little piece of information if you turn out to be a bad actor and we need to enforce and comply and, and, and force you to comply in some way or sanction you or whatever it is. So I don't think, Bridget, if I understand this correctly, we've articulated that piece other than to just know that that's out there as sort of the, the last piece of the regulatory activity. Yeah, just that's what I put in the next steps at the bottom of the memo. I right, think okay. Yeah. So this is so, right. This is just the tool. Right now, we're my hope for this discussion was to at least lay these out as possible tools and then see if anybody had any thoughts about whether we shouldn't use any of these or had additional thoughts about other things that were we might be missing, I think. So input, Justice Tucker. So implicit in some of the tools that are mentioned here is that every sandbox is that there will be some kind of process for complaints to be reported. But I thought it might be worth um, specifically having a topic for complaints, because we say that there's going to be a, you know, on the badge, there's a complaint number. So that's complaints made to the sandbox entity. But it seems to me we might want to require every single sandbox entrant to have a robust complaint process uh, that might, you know, that is data that the sandbox entrant, will, sure. sandbox regulator will be able to review. Um, and that um, perhaps there'll be a like an ombuds person at the um, at the sandbox uh, entrant that will you know engage with those complaints and be a, a good generator of information. So I just thought calling out a, an ent a sandbox entrant specific complaints process would be a good thing. And then my second and last point: uh, secret shopper programs um, seem to me like maybe a backup for compliance auditing. They're sort of an active and a passive way of doing audits. And uh, it seems to me we might not want or need uh, or be able to afford uh, secret shopper uh, review, except in those circumstances where the sandbox uh, regulator felt that compliance auditing was after the fact was somehow insufficient. So I thought there might be some room for moving things around and making that like a secondary thing to the audits. Great, thank you for that. Wendy? I agree with the first part of what Justice Tucker said about the complaint process. I think that would be great to add. Additionally, I would like some clarity about um, the ways in which these entities would market themselves and what would have to be disclosed to the consumers so that consumers, when determining where to go on the marketplace, um, know what they're getting um, and that there be some um, very clear but easy <laughs> to understand communication so that the um, consumer can make a, a reasoned choice about whether to use this provider or not. And also a consideration of advertising, um, meaning would there be some sort of provision um, related to advertising where these entities would have to very explicitly indicate that they're on a, un, under a separate um, construct sure. than attorneys uh, have. Yeah, we'll and just I struggle with that. You know, I we have a bad we have a disclosure that's basically very blunt and says this is not a law firm, you know, that they have to use, and then tries to explain how this could be a different in terms of the level of you know training or whatever. I mean, there's some wording in there, but it, to make that plain English and to make that effective is frankly easier said than done. So, but I, I you know, I, I think. There is a reference here to disclosure requirements. The badge that uh, is required would, I think, be a badge that they would have to be posted on all of their outward facing literature, website, or whatever that would make it clear they are a regulated legal services entity. You know, so I, I guess the question would be how specific and how, you know, the, the text of all that. But those are certainly 
tools that I support using. Okay, yeah, so you, if you think if you think that the language that we have on there about disclosure and badges should be um, if you have like suggestions for how I can beef that up for the re recommendation to the working group, just let me know. I'd be happy to, um, although not at this exact second, but I'd be happy to. Oh sure, yeah. Draft something and uh, about that particular notice to consumer in a in a understandable methodology. Great, and it, I think it's also covered. If you look at the um, the Utah manual, they have some exam. There's an example in there too about some of the language that they require. It's in the big long attachment. Thank so you. So why that. why don't we try to take the same approach on this as we discussed taking on the prior regulation or, or, or recommendation and see if we can bring something forward to the uh, working group along the lines of what we have drafted here with this input having been taken into account. And I see lots of people apologizing to want to take off. I want to thank everybody for sticking around a few extra minutes and for the good work today. Um, and let's call ourselves adjourned unless there's anything else that we need to raise. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.